I'm very conscious in this room, we've got patients who have been dealing with CLL for a really long time. And there might be people who are still quite new to it all. And there's often a bit of anxiety when you meet the registrar and clinic instead of the ever handsome and ever youthful professor follows. Uh, and it's just to try and explain a bit about what we're more likely to be doing, our skill sets, and just try and explain the huge, hugely diverse array of people who are registrars in the clinic. So I'm a haematology ST6, as you'll often see on my letters. That means I'm a trainee in haematology and I've been a trainee for six years, ST6. But every four or five years, the government changes our branding and what junior doctors are. And then we have a whole new array of numbers. We used to be known as SPRs, specialist registrars. We've been known as STRs in the past, specialist trainee registrars. But generally, it's about the same in the number ST6. If you're in Cambridge or Oxford or some of the London centres, there's this other very nebulous concept called academic clinical fellows which is what I am as well. Briefly, that means I'm paid by both the hospital and the university. So right now, 90% of my time is, goes to the university and 10% goes to the hospital. So I spend most of my time working in research. And you'll find these academic clinical fellows like me dotted all around the country. But what we tend to do is we're there for a longer period of time in one hospital or one region. So the big recruit that got me up to Cambridge as I've been working in London for the previous five years was you can move to Addenbrooke's in a nice city, and you don't have to move hospitals again, which when you're looking to settle down and have a family is a really attractive thing. Uh, and so that's why Cambridge managed to recruit me out of London. But the academic clinical fellow concept gets very confusing as well, because that means I'm much older than I actually am for SD6, because we slow down our training to try and do more research alongside things. Uh, I'd rather just be called Yain, though, than all the other different titles I get. So if you do see me, do just call me Yain, please. Uh, I thought I'd start with my first encounter of CLL, which was when I used to work as a scientist in Guy's Hospital, not the Shard, but when they built the Shard, I remember it going up, they had to redecorate Guy's Hospital next door to it because it was such an ugly building, they felt they needed to reclad it. Uh, and my lab was on the fifth floor where that red arrow is. Uh, and we, and when I was still a master's student, a very lovely chap called Professor Steve Devereux, who was a, a really involved in the CLL world, approached my professor and said, I think there's something in this enzyme activation induced cyclin diaminase. Can you look at it in CLL patients? So we, we did that here in that, um, in that little red, red arrow. It was a really unusual lab because it was on the fifth floor. We had 30 floors above us. And when it rained, it came through the ceiling on our floor. And I really never understood that. But this was one of those first seminal approaches to um, CLL understanding some of the enzymes that caused the mutations and genetics in it. And I hadn't gone to med school by this point, but I'd already heard of CLL before I'd started. And actually, really, that's what started me on my journey to moving into haematology even before I went to medical school. So what actually is a haematology registrar? Now, to get to being a registrar in the UK, you have to have done two years as what's called a foundation doctor and at least two years in what's called core training. So you could be a registrar as young as four years after you leave medical school. And then you have to spend five years in continuous training as a minimum as a registrar before you can reach a consultant. So that's a minimum of nine years out of medical school before you can go from the very first person to being a consultant. And all this time, you are a junior doctor. While you're a registrar, your practice is always still supervised by a consultant. In Adam Brooks, it's Professor Follows. Uh, in other hospitals, it tends to be the lead for that specialty and that service. And registrars, obviously very huge amount of experience because this is the smallest amount of time you can take and I'll show you how it can get longer in a second but when you suddenly see the registrar in the clinic this could be someone who is just about to be a consultant or it could be someone who you are the very first CLL patient they are ever seeing in their entire career and I imagine this second is much scarier for you as patients as well and I'm always very mindful of that because the number of times we have patients who know so much more about their disease, what treatments are coming out, what side effects the treatments are expected to cause than junior doctors is really quite humbling. And so it's always important for us, and I often remind my, my more junior registrars, do listen to the experienced patients because they really are so educated and so clued up now on what the side effects are, what things they want to be treated, but what, what's important for them to tell us and also what information they want from us. If there's ever any doubt as a registrar in a clinic or on the wards, you'll find them just going, I'll just nip off around the corner to talk to the consultant to discuss the case, or they might have done that before as well. It's very, very unusual for the registrars to be working completely independently 
and nearly always your decisions are checked either before the clinic started. So we will sit down and see whose patients we're going to see and have a discussion about what the blood tests have shown already. Or at the end of the clinic, you tend to sit down with the boss and talk through it all then as well. So what I wanted to try and explain was the UK training pathway and why you might not necessarily only be four years out of medical school when you see a registrar and clinic. And this is particularly more pertinent in the larger academic centres around the country. So we think of the big university hospitals, but actually you'll encounter junior doctors on this pathway the whole way through. So as I've mentioned, you start in medical school. Now, if you're an undergraduate, that takes you a minimum of five years. If you were a postgraduate entering like me, you can do it in four years. Most people tend to take an extra year in medical school at some point to do an additional degree as well. And then they move into foundation training, which is quite regimented. And these are a lot of the people you saw carrying those big orange placards outside the hospitals this week as well. Now, foundation training takes two years, assuming you are working full time. But sometimes people take a bit longer, either for health reasons or because they want to work less than full time. And after the second year of foundation training is really when everyone goes to Australia. So what you find is you have to do your first two years to get your full registration, be fully qualified as a doctor. And then most of my friends decided they wanted to do a couple of years adventuring before they went off to be stuck in this pipeline that can go on for many, many years. So they all go off to Australia and New Zealand for a couple of years. You get new experiences, you see healthcare provided in a different setting, and then you come back over. Uh, at this point, after my F2, I actually moved up to Cambridge, uh, which felt like a very exotic place to go instead of Australia. But so when you then move into the ST1, which can be the first year of specialist training, uh, in haematology, actually, we don't work that way. We do two more years of being a general physician. So you're still on the wards treating people with any form of medical problem. But what we're not doing is operating, delivering babies or dealing with children at this point. We're very much focusing just being on the board. Now, the ST1, ST2 years, you start doing a few more exams. So this is when you start getting things like your membership to the Royal College of Physicians, which is more postgraduate exams, and you have to go and do a, a fairly nervy practical at the end. And after ST2, that's another opportunity to then go to Australia. But <laughs> after that trip, you then have to apply to your next round of training, which is your specialist training. So you then differentiate into saying, I want to be a haematologist, I want to be a kidney doctor, I want to be a lung doctor. And that's the point where you start meeting registrars in haematology, is that end of ST2, start of ST3. So you could be meeting someone who has left medical school five or six years ago, gone and worked in Australia for a couple of years, come back, done a couple of years here, gone away again to work in America for a year, and then come back to enter into specialist training. So actually, those four years can suddenly really stretch out to a doctor with a huge amount of experience, maybe not in haematology, but in a wide range of different situations. If you're people like me, you'll find that at this time you start diverting off into the university and doing more research. So while I'm still staying on the wards and still staying current, my training slowed down because I was publishing papers and getting very excited about white blood cells on a, te on a test tube. And then you move into the ST3 pathway, and this is in the UK, very regimented and set. It's five years. You spend most of that time as a haematologist anyway in the big tertiary university um, hospitals. And then you rotate out to the district hospitals for maybe one or two years, depending on which part of training you're in. Uh, in, the, in Adam Rooks, we tend to go to either Bury St Edmunds for a year or Peterborough or Ipswich, the sort of places you'll commonly see our faces. Uh, you can ask to go to other places as well if you want to. During that time, the specialist training, some people just decide I want to get on and be a consultant because I know I don't want to work as the next professor follows. I'm not interested in running a research group or clinical trials. And those people will look to just get through their training and get, become a consultant as fast as possible. But particularly if you're around the Cambridge area, uh, my friends in Oxford as well do the same. Most people t get, do two or three years more of being a registrar and then they take time out to do their PhD with the university. So they'll still be attending a clinic from time to time. They'll still be on the ward doing the on-call. And if you ever phone up those, the patient helpline numbers, that doctor at the end is still probably someone an awful lot like me. But you'll find that that number, ST3, 4, 5, 6, 7, stops going up for a few years while you do your PhD. So you're getting older and older with more and more experience, but you're still nonetheless a registrar. And it, when you come back into training, you then try and finish off all the final bits of sign-offs because we have these nebulous logbooks that you have to get signatures on to say I've 
done X number of bone marrow biopsies and seen X, Y number of patients in clinic. And if that's all signed off, you can then become a consultant. Or you can then cross back into the research field or move into pharmaceutical industry or go back to Australia, which is a lot of people doing at the moment. Um, it's a running theme amongst my colleagues that I'm missing them all at the moment. And that would really be how you would get from someone who you think, oh, I'm seeing a registrar, they're only four years out of med school, to, oh my gosh, this person might have actually been left med school 15 years ago. How are they not a consultant? Because they've done all these other things as well. And I hope that explains why some people look very, very grey and old as registrars, and some people look incredibly young and fresh-faced, and hopefully some of us in the middle as well. So I wanted to take a moment and talk about CLL and clinical training in haematology. Because I've already mentioned, I, I genuinely believe most of you all know a lot more about the treatments coming up than the vast majority of my colleagues and I do in the hospital. And that's really because when, we, when I started medical school in 2010, there wasn't very much available to CLL at that point, even though it felt like the list was incredibly long. And then since then, the number of new drugs that keep appearing on the market every year, we're getting new trials, new combinations, new therapies, and it's getting so exciting because there's so many more arrays and different ways of treating, but much, much harder to learn them all as a haematology registrar. My first clinic in CLL was in 2011-12 uh, with Steve Devereux, the person I mentioned earlier, and he mentioned, oh, there's this fun new trial I'm starting with ibrutinib um, with Dr. O'Brien out in America. I hope it does well. And so down in Kings, the very early patients were starting on ibrutinib back then, and it completely changed the landscape from my, from my memory almost overnight, and Prof. Devereux was so excited by that. Uh, I obviously was a new clinical student, so I didn't quite understand the significance back then of how great a new chemotherapy-free tablet could be and how transformative it was for so many patients' lives. And then from there, I obviously really kept an eye on CLL, and particularly haematology in general. But the number of new treatments that kept just appearing on the market, every year at ASH we'd see another new fancy headline trial saying we've got another new brilliant tablet combination. And I was already thinking, oh my gosh, by the time I qualify, there's going to be so many more drugs I'm going to have to learn how to spell. It's going to be really hard. Uh, and sure enough, that was the case. And it hasn't got any easier because I sort of stopped this list in you know, 2018 and just carried them on, partly because there were too many to add on. But a haematology registrar like myself now, by the time I'm a consultant, there'll be even more drugs appearing that are going to be licensed, they'll be regulated for us on the NHS, or that will be coming in the following years that we have to have such a wide and for, for, uh, vision and being seeing so far what's going to come to start thinking about what the right choices are. And that really is a skill in an art. So how do the registrars get up to speed? Well, firstly, when I meet you in clinic and you talk, if you go, oh, I'd heard about that really exciting thing on the CLL forum, that is a really common way that we start hearing about new drugs that you have to go away and hurriedly Google and learn about. <laughs> um, there's the postgraduate haematology textbook hasn't been updated since 2017. <laughs> Very difficult to stay up to current and current treatments now. But it was our absolute bible of learning how to get through the basics of haematology. There's the BCSH guidelines. Uh, if I had to do this talk last year, I don't think there was anything there since 2013. So it was really great that we've got an up-to-date guideline of what treatments are available now. And certainly giving you a feel of what algorithms. But again, that's now out. And that's, going, that's already out of date because ASH last year had the very exciting new treatments available with things like, you know, I brute, uh, I brute in the Venetoclax that just weren't even re referenced in there. There's UK CLL forums, but they're really helpful in patient information and newsletters that we get around that just help push stuff to the top of your memory, just jog you going, oh, I did see that was out. That's really exciting. Uh, so those are really good ways to get us up to speed when we're starting going into training. And then there's the ASH education book, which is freely available online. It goes into a huge amount of science, but particularly when you're starting as a haematology registrar, you try and assimilate all this information so you can be knowledgeable in those first clinics. But that's great because that was all published and then the world moves forward. So then how do we stay up to speed that the world is continually evolving, there are new drugs and new treatments coming out? Well, that book's no longer working, that's now defunct as well. So we start moving into the much more contemporary spaces. The newsletters that are coming from charities and patient organisations or being aware of the press releases from pharmaceutical uh, companies as well and things like the ASH education book that comes out every year. These really are the things that registrars start reading, taking note of, and start to think, well, I need to be more familiar with those drugs because, well, the Americans are really excited about them. That's going to be in our clinic in a couple of years' time, so I need to know 
what I'm going to manage at that point. So this is borrowed from a talk I had to give to some, some school children a few years ago. Uh, but this is any normal Wednesday for me as a haematology registrar when I was covering the lymphoma service. Uh, and I just thought I'd talk through our sort of day-to-day -day life at sort of my level. So as I said, midway through my training, lots still to go, but we're still trying to show you how we stay current and contemporary and all the different places we get pulled and stretched and then where we try and fill in the gaps as well. So my normal day starts at well, 5.45 in the morning and then I'll go straight to the gym. Uh, and then from the gym, I tend to cycle up to Adam Brooks and from 8 to 8.45 every morning, the registrars have teaching. So this is our consultants and some of the senior colleagues will come in and either give us a lecture or a series of cases where we are trying to make diagnoses, discuss treatment plans, and trying to just generally learn either from people's experiences or from example cases, how we can get better and how we can improve our knowledge. So every morning we have this very structured regime. Unfortunately, the NHS doesn't pay for your training, it just pays for your time. So that, that bit comes as an aside. And then on a Wednesday, and I chose Wednesday very deliberately because it's very lymphoma and CLL focused, is our big MDT. So it's the East of England Lymphoma and CLL uh, MDT in Cambridge, which is great for the registrars to get to because you get to see all the experts around the entire region discussing every case that's going to have a diagnostic decision that week and an important treatment decision. And they all get presented and then we can discuss the pros and cons of each before we then go meet you all in clinic and to explain those decisions and our thought processes to you. But for those discussions to happen, I work a lot like a secretary at this point. So I'll be printing out all the lists of everyone to make sure we've got all the right information in the right place making sure that these very important, because it's a legal document as well, the templates are filled in appropriately. So when we come to that case to discuss, we can move through it in a good speed. And then the MDT itself is in a big room. It looks an awful lot like this, but without quite as much fancy lighting. And we sit there and normally Professor follows chairs it in the East of England, but sometimes it's other consultants around the region when he's not available. And we present every case we talk through all the important stuff, so it could be the CT scans, so we'll have experts from radiology there, any biopsy results, so we'll have histopathologists, people who just look at it under the microscope there as well. Then we'll have the haematologists, like myself, presenting the case from a clinical side, saying blogs is doing much better or much worse, and these are the symptoms. And then we'll sort of synthesize all that information together and come up with a consensus recommendation of where we think treatment is headed, what the final diagnosis might be, or what we want to do next. Uh, that is a hugely, hugely valuable learning opportunity because you get to literally see how everyone's minds work and how all these different types of subspecialties and different parts of medicine are required just to make one diagnosis of something like CLL. Um, the registrars in this case have to be in it and we are the ones normally writing the whole thing down, minuting it and taking the documentation. So when you then see us in clinic on that Wednesday afternoon, we've probably just been discussing your case for the previous hour. So on my Wednesday, I teach my medical students. So I tend to try and uh, meet them from 1.30 uh, till 2, just to make sure they're having a good week because I'm responsible for their clinical training and education as well. And I think midway through the week, that's quite a good time for them to meet. If anyone's been mean to them or shouted at them, I can at least nip it in the bud early as well. Um, I try and eat my lunch with them as well at the same time. And then I get to clinic. Uh, now. Anyone who's been to any, any of our Adam Brooks clinics will know that timekeeping has never been our strongest point. <laughs> um, although I'm told that's fairly consistent across the whole country for haematologists, so I don't know whether we just missed that class in school about timekeeping. But our clinics, we want to think, and certainly yeah, Adam Brooks thinks they finish at 5 or 5.30, and that's what they'll pay us to, but reality, we're still going at 7 o'clock every night. Uh, and that's okay, because genuinely clinics are the most fun part of the week because I get to see people, we get to talk, we meet, hear truly fascinating stories and see how well everyone's doing and enjoying their quality of life because we've managed to find the right treatments for you. And also it's the challenging part when we haven't got treatments right or things are going wrong and we have to try and step in, but that might be rewarding later in the world. So that will take us to about seven o'clock and then at that point, I've now met, I haven't mentioned my emails on my pages once in this, and that's because the list is getting longer and longer. So I tend to go back to our offices and start getting through all those emails that I've neglected for the day because I've been doing all the other things. All those prescriptions that we haven't had a chance to sign and send out, and making the referrals, getting the scans requested. That's really what I'll do till about nine o'clock, and then I'll get a text from my wife going, where are you? And I'll cycle home. Uh, 
And that's the general day of Adam Rook's hematology. Uh, each of us have a slightly different role because we might only be spending four or five months on lymphoma at a time. So you'll find one registrar does this on a Wednesday for four or five months and they'll move on. But others will then spend a lot more time in the lymphoma service like me and then you'll find us doing this every Wednesday. And it's great. Uh, so the big question is how do you go from, if anyone saw Scrubs, it was my favorite show growing up, but how do you go from someone like JD, who's a very young doctor, to the professor follows? And the UK model is very much it's copied across the world now, and it's the Western approach to medicine, which is time at the coalface. You need to buy in and trust the process. You need to spend those years learning the ropes, sitting in those important meetings like the MDT, spending time with our patients in clinic, chatting to them, making those diagnoses. And after that huge amount of time, and I know five years of registrar doesn't sound like very much, but the hours do eventually add up, you will have enough experience to start having that independent practice and being a consultant. So the process of being in the hospital, being exposed to all that training, is what gives us the experience to move forward. Separately, there is the study. So we still have to do exams. To enter haematology training, I've already mentioned one set of exams called the membership to the Royal College of Physicians. The exit exams, you then have to get your fellowship to the Royal College of Pathologists, or FRC PATH, as you'll often see after our names, uh, which is a fairly entertaining three-day exam where you have to take your own microscope with you. Uh, which is quite fun sitting on the tube with this giant microscope. Um, we have this huge amount of reflection because medicine, for all its brilliant parts, you still have to sit and think about, did I do that well? What can I do better next time? And we're really encouraged to keep reflective journals, just difficult cases, things that challenge us mentally, things where we've got it wrong, made mistakes. We need to be very aware of our own shortcomings. And that actually helps then develop the process as well so you then next time are in the clinic or on the ward, you don't make that the wrong decision a second time. And then the last thing is really working with patients because you can only learn so much sitting in a library, memorizing the textbooks, watching all the lectures online. We have to get out and meet you all and learn how to talk to you, how to communicate with you, how to work with you, so we can actually then become better physicians ourselves. And those are the really key parts of being a, a hematology registrar that lets us go from the very junior people you might first meet to the eminent professor follows, who I promise you did start that way once as well. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of reflect now a bit about where patient groups and charities come into doctors and training. Uh, firstly, from my own experience, I was very mindful that I was at an ASH symposium a couple of years ago, uh, and the, the CLL forum there managed to get two US patients to come out and talk about their experiences with CLL. Uh, and it's still one of those talks that stuck with me after all, like three years later. And I have now been to hundreds of conference talks during that time. And it's the personal element of it is so much more emotive and so much more powerful than yet another slide with a survival curve on or yet another bar chart. And so it's a really powerful way of learning. And actually, these sorts of opportunities to meet you all and also to see what you guys, all the work that's done, is something that gets fed back to the other registrars as well. Everyone was really, uh, really interested to hear that. This is what I was doing on my Saturday afternoon. And people then go and look, at, look, at, look it up and go, wow, that's so cool. And then you just bookmark that website and you start being aware of it. We get those emails, you mention it quietly in the coffee queue. And that sort of education is really, really important for us. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, these are the common charities that we tend to encounter in haematology. You will probably recognize <laughs> quite a lot of them already. Uh, and they all have very different supports. Our nurse specialists, Gwyn and Sarah, who many of you all know, are oh, fantastic advocates for a lot of these. And they're forever just going, oh no, I can just email someone at the charity because you need that really important, like, hand out that sheet of information or there's a sort of local support group for them. And having that relationship, that link is so useful for us because it helps us talk to the patients and know that when you leave our clinics, you're not just left alone. There's more support out there, there's more help for you. There's more, and also a lot of information can come back to us as well. We've had issues in the past where we want a specific chemotherapy information that hadn't been translated into the correct language. We can reach out to the charities who might happen to know either someone who's proficiently bilingual or they can re recommend professional translating services to help us convert that into like language that people can understand. And that's such a useful skill. And the NHS doesn't have those resources. So we're so lucky when we get that coming across. Others put on education specialist training events and or sponsor parts of larger conferences. So again, we get to see the branding, get to be aware of what's out there. So when patients go, 
what else is there for me? It's already for the forefront of our uh, brains and our minds as well. And some others are much more in the background, such as Anthony Nolan. They are the people who help us with stem cell transplants. They help do all the registry searching as well. Uh, and they provide huge amounts of information to our patients when they need it. But from a haematology uh, registrar side, they're the people we're forever emailing going, I have blogs, can you help me find a match? Uh, and so many of these people do this for free or out of the goodness of their hearts. It really is quite incredible. Uh, the number of charity volunteers that are just so passionately involved in trying to make cancer a much more manageable and better experience for everyone in the UK and worldwide. It, honestly, it is really incredible. So I thought I'd try and explain why do I think charity engagement and engagement for yourselves to the junior doctors matters more to us. Well, I'm a bit younger than Professor Follows, although I probably don't look it. And engaging with the junior doctors at a younger er level, the, doctor, the juniors of today will be the consultants tomorrow. So having those early relationships allows you to form a much longer relationship with the doctors. Consultants for tomorrow are going to be looking to develop new practices and help. They often are the ones who innovate and drive those early changes. And change comes from what patients want, not because of what doctors want to try and achieve. So if you're working with those senior registrars or those doctors who are just about to be consultants going, we really think this would be a fantastic new service for the hospital. Those are the people who really like to have the energy, the spare time and the capacity in their, their job plans to help bring those in. So meeting them at a good time and getting meeting them early is so important for that as well. And then the future of treatments and research, again, is led by our patients. There's no point trying to cure something in a mouse that's never going to have any application in clinic. So being aware of what patients want, where they want their treatments to go. To, I know, again, a lot of the registrars and gene doctors are doing PhDs and will start running their own research groups in the future. So being able to sort of say, no, I wish there was more time spent on a tablet to take rather than the next treatment I have to spend six months in hospital for. Those are really important things that just help shape, even on a very subtle level, how people's research and decision making goes. So, very finally, I thought I would just leave you my thoughts on why the world is getting even more confusing for CLL for people like me and what my work and research is all about. So, the way I've sort of split my headspace into CLL is we've got this huge number of really exciting tablet based treatments that can be taken once, twice a day, or a couple of times a week that will give really good control of disease, as many of you will know. There are unfortunately side effects to all of these, and we can try and find the right treatment for the right patient, and that's brilliant. And for most people, that's all they want. But then, I'm very mindful, a very dear friend of mine has been diagnosed with CLL. He was 39, he worked in the London Fire Brigade, uh, and he now can no longer fight fires. And his big thing, he was uh, very clear to me, was, you know, I, want, I don't want tablets, I want to get back to doing all the, the fun stuff he does, because he, he thought he was action man, and he still basically looks like it. So it's going for those other types of treatments that are going to be a bit more heavy-handed in the short term, but then might give people longer treatments afterwards. And this is where a lot of my research comes in, which is the immunotherapeutic side. And that's why we're trying to learn about bispecifics with clever new antibodies to try and trick the immune system to killing cancer cells, or these CAR T cells where we're genetically engineering white blood cells against the cancer and then giving them back to the patients. These are all fantastic, but they're quite hard work for patients. The side effects can be really quite bad. They can put you in hospital for long periods of time in some cases. And that's not for everyone, particularly when you can think, well, I can just take a tablet and carry on my daily life. So my work focuses a lot more on the genetic engineering of these white blood cells, not to try and kill the cancer, because that bit's been worked out. But we're trying to find ways of making these cells much more livable, so you don't have to spend the next four weeks and miss Christmas sitting in hospital having these cells infusions. You might just have to come in once every week to have a small injection and go home. And it's trying to understand how we can control the immune system better. That is where I very much see the future of the heavy-handed approach with these, heavy, these really aggressive, expensive therapies going for some people. But then the vast majority of our time in registrars, our brain space needs to be focusing on seeing you in clinics and just keeping getting all these new exciting treatments that are just appearing now. And these are all the ones I remembered at ASH this year. Where they're, I'm, I'm sure I'll be seeing these in clinic in the next five years. So I'm going to have to learn how to spell even more drug names at that point. Um, and then, why is this so com complicated for the registrars? Well, we're still trying to remember all the different parts of haematology and we're still learning. But this graph is just trying to show that 
based on treatments that you might receive in the past, is going to change what treatments you'll probably be able to receive in the future, partly because the cancers change and develop resistance, and also because the NHS tell us what we can and can't give based on previous lines of treatment. So it's not just learning all the fancy new treatments that are out there, it's trying to navigate this absolute quagmire now of, well, if you've had treatment X, well, now you can't have treatment Y, but you can have treatment A. And suddenly we find this, instead of going from drug one to two to three, we have to start navigating these different paths through all the treatments available. It's incredibly lucky that we have all these treatments to us, but this is why registrars still have to spend all their time with the consultants, because consultants have this experience of knowing how to navigate these complicated treatment algorithms that we just haven't had the years and years of experience doing. And so often these are the treatment decisions, discussions in the MDT that we're learning all the time, so that when we do see you in clinic, we can try and give a better idea. So I thought I'll finish off with my very final uh, reflections here, and then anyone who wants to ask questions, please do. Uh, I've really felt the treatment of CLL has changed so much in my very short career, and I think it's going to keep changing at this speed. There's so many more drugs, so many more exciting ways of delivering these drugs, and then so many new ones coming out. Uh, COVID-19 obviously was a huge part of the last few years. It taught, for me, we can do lots of things very well, and actually I learned very quickly that quite a lot of people are quite happy having a telephone appointment rather than coming in to see the doctor and paying really expensive parking and waiting the waiting for four hours when things are going well. But when things are going badly, they want to get in and see us. So we learned that we can do telephone clinics, but we've also learned that we shouldn't do everything on telephone, if that makes sense, and still still see people when they need to. And that was one of the first times we started really getting very strong feedback from our patients about what new services we should be developing and setting up. Uh, and with pa patients, they don't want to spend much time in hospital. We need to be thinking how we can better tailor their, their approaches. The NHS now is really on a knife edge in terms of what's going to happen, both with human resources, with politics, and also with fi financial money. So there was a real interest in think, seeing how can we change and improve services. So when people do have ideas of how they want they wish things existed, do mention it, because that's how we start trying to innovate new services, innovate better ways to treat our patients and try and make you all enjoy coming to NHS more than you do. So I said I'd speak for 30 minutes. That's exactly 30 minutes. So thank you very much. And please, any questions?